Welcome to another King's Crush uh, radio show. So this is uh, actually Wednesday. I had a club match. Had to postpone till uh, today. As usually on Tuesday at ten past nine. So streaming to uh, Play Chess and also to YouTube. Okay, I thought we could carry on from last week and look at Chess Gamescom best of the best. Uh, the years we were looking at in the 19th century, uh, some classic 19th century games between 1800 and 1899. Uh, so these are like uh, in many people's games collections at Chess Gamescom, and they're really quite beautiful games uh, to go through. I think many times, <laughs> like a good film, you know, you like to sometimes watch a good film more than once. Now the first one, let's have a look at Laska against Bayer. So this is in 1889 in Amsterdam, Amsterdam tournament. Okay, so let's put on a bit, sir. <clears throat> and live book. And let's have a look. So Laska playing white played f4. The birds opening, so controlling dark square. Black actually obliges with white's dark square play, playing on the light squares, occupying the light squares. So you see, there's dark square, dark square play. E3, knight f6. We have a kind of Nimzo Larsen type position with control of the dark squares. You like one would like basically black to do this sometimes. In fact. If you want a nifty move order, you can play knight f3, and after d5, play b3, you get kind of this dark square grip once this d5 has been committed to. But anyway, in this game, uh, we have this position, so it's a bit Nimzo Larson territory, it looks a little bit like it. That nice grip on the dark squares. Bishop e7. Now, a curious move here, it doesn't look too stereotypical, but uh, is it exploitable? Bishop d3 is played. Perhaps black should play something like c5, it would maybe an idea later of disrupting this bishop somehow, but black played b6. We have knight c3 and now bishop b7, knight f3, knight b7 and both sides castle. Knight e2. So it looks as though there's two nice kind of bishops here pointing at black's king. c5 is played now. Perhaps black should try and knock out this light square bishop. Maybe he didn't sense too much danger because where is this bishop actually going? Yeah, if it goes here, I don't think that helps. Just c6 and it has to go back. Or, you know, it doesn't help. So maybe knight c5 was an opportunity to get rid of this potentially dangerous attacking uh, bishop but uh, instead we see c5 so this operation to get this knight to the king side is working knight g3 queen c7 knight e5 using a nice grip on the dark squares Tartaka once said if you get a knight on e5 the attack plays itself is that the case here let's see Knight takes e5 is played, and after the bishop takes, it's difficult for black to do this. I think this is fatal if black plays bishop d6, I suspect. Yes, it looks fatal because uh, it's actually a forced checkmate if this happens. We have queen h4 here. Check. Knight h5. And that's going to be the end of that. Black's resorting to desperate moves to stave off a mate. So basically, uh, as one might expect, that's not on the cards in this position. Bishop f6 just wins by force. Queen c6, as though pointing at white's king rather cheekily with this battery. Okay, queen e2 defending g2, but also keeping the possibility of knight h5 alive. And in fact, here after a6, it looks as though black's trying to creep up the queen side potentially like this to dislodge this bishop. White now reacts quickly with knight h5. One point to note here about 
uh, the G2 uh, square. Well, it's interesting. Black maybe was trying to lure the queen away from G2 here and played a move probably expecting a recapture. Black actually played knight takes h5, probably expecting queen takes. First of all, just before we look at knight takes, the game continuation, I don't think d4 is too hot here, even though it opens up that diagonal. Bishop takes. And white can continue, it seems, keeping an eye on g2 with queen g4. And so here, rook f3. And this is really dangerous, this position here. If, say here, it gets really dangerous. Black's going to get hacked to death in these lines. That's, for example, that's a mate in two. So it is actually very, very dangerous. This situation where Black played knight takes h5. It's already dangerous. D4 doesn't seem to help. Um, anyway, so knight takes h5 probably with the expectation of an improvement with D4. So if queen takes, mm, actually d4 is not possible actually <laughs> because the mate threat but maybe uh, after dealing with the mate threat then you know d4 might be on the cards uh, might be but okay uh, instead of knight takes though white played uh, a different move which there's not too many brilliant moves to quiz you over so I'm just going to show it white actually sacked the bishop here to gain a key tempo of check. So king takes, queen takes, after king g8. Guess what white plays here, if I give you five seconds. So white play here. What would you play in this position? So this is Lasker against Bayer, if you just joined. It's 1889. Lasker is actually a really brilliant player. I've analysed many of his games and, and found really good accuracy in his play, actually. Uh, and this is no exception, this game. Okay. White's play. Plays bishop, takes g7. Give yourself 50 points. So Fred's then the immediate checkmate. Black takes this, but now of the queen g4, this is embarrassing. This position for Black's king. This rook can swing via the h file. If king f6, that's the end of it immediately. Queen g5 checkmate. So the king is forced to go onto the h file, and we get this lovely rook lift, threatening this mate coming up. Well, off the bishop h4. Black tries uh, e5 to lend support over here defensively white has invested already a bishop so giving up the queen to get a rook and a bishop doesn't seem totally the end of the world so black plays on for a bit with this continuation check gives up the queen because remember it's for rook and bishop but unfortunately here the bishops are fought by the queen we have bishop f6 so the material is really nice for white here. Uh, kind of, yeah, it's easier with the queen sometimes, especially if it's got some assistance, if she has some assistance. So king g7 is played. Uh, one point here, if e takes, doesn't help actually this, because queen takes, uses that pin, gaining a tempo, and then say rook f1. Getting the rook out way is good for white. Coordination on f6 here. Uh, so black didn't bother with that. Black played king g7. And we have rook f1. Rook ab8. Queen d7. Check. F takes. Now here, if bishop takes, then white has queen f5. And that's winning that bishop. For example, here, queen takes. I think there's also the same sort of thing, queen h5, as well. 
So black has a further concession to make here. Can't take this pawn. Bishop retreats. This pawn is used with deadly effect with e6. Press the immediately. Rook f7 and taking the bishop here to defend. But now queen g6 putting the pressure on. Not too many move choices here to defend apart from f6. White's play here carries on very nicely in this position. White's play here. If I give you 20 seconds. It's a nice little combination again here yeah, very nicely calculated by Alaska brilliant combination well not as brilliant as the earlier one it's actually rook takes f6 and it has to factor in uh, the possibility of king e8 leaving black with two rooks against the queen so this position must have been visualized but there's a loose piece in this position and loose pieces tend to fall off as John Nunn says and in fact can you see how white now wins the rook on b7 if I give you uh, 20 seconds again how does white play here really increasing advantage dramatically okay so it's two rooks against the queen but this rook is a loose piece so we play check and then we play check and then we win that loose piece because loose pieces tend to fall off and that's really become hopeless and it, to me it's a sign of authenticity for the game that we see actually black struggling on for a few more moves this really might have happened in 1889 quite a long way back for recorded chess games really but uh, black played on a little bit and here after queen takes that clarifies things that the King and Pawn is totally one. Black just resigned here. Very neat game uh, from Lasker. Maybe some slight inaccuracies. Black missed this chance to chop off this dangerous light square bishop with knight c5 at a crucial point when White was doing that transfer of the knight aggressively. But apart from that, it has a beauty to this game. You can see why many people collect it as one of Lasker's great games. Okay, the next game I'd like to show you is McDonald against the Bordelais. This is a real classic. I think we should have it from Black's perspective. This was played in London in 1834. E4 from McDonald. The Bordelais plays the Sicilian defence. And we see here, after knight takes e5, so this is the lone fall and Kalashnikov variations. Knight takes, this might not be the most optimal move actually, knight takes. I think nowadays knight b5 is the main popular move, trying to get some advantage here. It goes for example like this quite often actually this looks like a sufficient trans transposition uh, to, to avoid it looking entirely like a Sveshnikov white doesn't have to go into Sveshnikov white can actually play c4 for example to get a bind that's interesting as well okay but anyway we have knight takes c6 so I'm not sure this is an optimal move and it sets a very interesting tone to the game position. Something's quite different about this opening now after B takes. 
another pawn going towards the center already it looks as though black has the signs of a nice promising pawn center we see bishop c4 which keeps a grip on d5 knight f6 which almost implies d5 might happen well the knight takes e4 as well that's pinned bishop e7 now the threat is knight takes e4 so white can't I believe castle I think it might actually be possible to do this white takes time to protect the pawn but now d5 yes d5 here it's interesting can white actually take this he didn't he took on f6 giving up the dark square bishop if he takes actually I think this is plausible this continuation but uh, it's slightly better for black however black took on f6 which might be slightly inferior okay his point well black's point is uh, I'm not sure this pawn is there for the taking it seems well it's not there for the taking rather um, okay and it's so basically the bishop retreated I mean if, if taking uh, you might think bishop b5 check well bishop d7 is okay for black the bishop actually uh, retreated and now both sides castle with a5 with the threat of bishop a6 but more crucially actually there's two threats with two threats more crucially is a4 as well a4 to trap the bishop so there's two threats of this and also a4 hit exists here as a threat so white took on d5 which addresses both actually uh, bishop a6 there's bishop c4 a4 there's bishop c4 okay so this this is a temporary reprieve okay back to the threat of a4 and bishop a6 now we have rook d1 addressing things okay getting out of the skewer line um, bishop a6 is still a reasonable move actually but actually d4 was played now black has it looks to be like a mobile pawn center and the bishop pair to support it as well if only white can blockade on the light squares his move here seems a bit radical c4 may not might not be the best because this becomes a real past pawn when the pawn was on c2 it's like a defensive measure against this d pawn but here these pawns do have the possibility of becoming more mobile than perhaps they should be better might have been knight c3 to try and get a, a light square blockade maybe even knight e4 later and for example bishop a6 maybe even queen e4 but anyway c4 yes if only these pawns could be uh, coming down together we have queen b6 with pressure on the queen side now bishop c2 setting a little trap if queen takes there's, there's bishop takes winning the queen uh, but bishop b7 now and actually here e4 is really dangerous e4 is actually dangerous here uh, with these kind of possibilities on b2 it's actually quite dangerous so white tries to uh, do something knight d2 okay with the queen and bishop here I don't think this is um, that good first there's queen d3 and if black did something about that then this is starting to be good for white it forces e4 um, or e4 immediately uh, this is okay for white uh, so it's not good to take that pawn we have rook a e8 this is more in the spirit of things let's try and get these pawns going a bit further okay knight e4 pressing a lot of damage here bishop d8 
c5 again the traps on it seems by the way that uh, if if we entertain this i don't think it works very well well there's this there's this way of doing it to win that bishop we can't really take that pawn okay so queen c6 though is much more thematic and on g2 and if f5 you can imagine for example this is getting really dangerous now on that diagonal for g2 we have f3 trying to blunt that diagonal but kind of weakening these dark squares with the dark square bishop this is a problem bishop e7 and now the pawns do start to push forward f5 check and it looks as though this is as a tactical move because bishop h bishop a4 skewing queen and rook what's going on here white's just won the exchange bishop takes white's just won the exchange but black still has that bishop hat and the pawns are looking quite dangerous not only that here queen e3 checks useful and also white's king hasn't got too many pieces around it we have c6 trying to blunt the pressure on this diagonal but here i mean if the bishop moved back i don't think this is going to help just check and this is this is crushing he takes yeah it's it's absolutely crushing this would be too late white's uh, king is getting mated so the king's safety is actually really uh compromised here so that's that's why white has to tread very very uh carefully so this move is is very careful in the circumstances it's probably the only move to stay in the game c6 we have e takes f3 and white now played rook c2 if he takes the bishop it's actually a forced mate again check and if here check and then we have that pattern of the rook and queen uh, kind of mating yeah there's no defense around white's king so yeah we have uh, rook c2 ignoring this bishop white's king safety has to be attended to check and now bishop moves bishop c8 we have bishop d7 f2 and the first major signs these pawns are a big problem queen e1 check is threatened already in this position uh if for example takes then queen e1 check and if queen f1 queen takes d1 is winning yeah like that um, so yeah the first sign already Queen e1 needs to be addressed rook f1 in advance of that but now d3 hitting this rook that pins uh, against the Queen now this d7 Bishop is taken was there a chance to take here I wouldn't have thought so by the way in fact I think Black has bishop e6 here. So that wouldn't have helped. Yeah. So we have c takes d7. Now look at the pawns. We've got three connected pass pawns here. There's a pass pawn here. Is that dangerous? Queen c8. Threatening to take. And then d8. That's blocked. We have queen c4. But now queen e1 the pressure is really being put to white rook c1 and now d2 yes the queen can't be uh taken i believe the queen c5 was played if rook takes takes this is over for white yeah so we have uh, Queen C5 to try and hold on. 
uh, fretting this that just tucks away there rook d1 but now e3 and the power of the free connected pass pawns is really formidable here after queen c3 guess what black plays in this position so black's play what would you play with black I think the position is really crushing. He can do a lot of things here. Yeah. yeah, e2 is probably winning. Uh, either rook is winning. Probably the stronger one is to take, as in the game, d1. And we get this beautiful final position with e2, where the pass pawns contribute to each other's threats, actually. They enhance each other's threats. There's a threat of f1, there's a threat of e1, potentially. There's just no parrying this. Queen and rook can't do anything. If takes, then we can choose f1. Yeah. So yeah, after e2, it's it's lost. White resigned. Um, yeah, there's just no defense. If queen c2, we can choose... Well, either F1 or, or E1, in fact. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, the past pawns are amazing. But we we saw them grow throughout the game, interestingly. Uh, it seems from the opening there was a, a seed of White's destruction. I don't think he helped his cause with that move C4 earlier on. It was like helping the past pawns be created. So another beautiful game, a classic game. So this is McDonald's. Board day 1834. Alright, I hope you enjoyed that one. Let's have a look at another Zucker Tort against Blackburn, nicknamed Black Death. Let's have a look at this Zucker Tort against Blackburn 1883, London. C4 from Zucker Tort. E6, we have knight f3. Sorry, we don't have knight f3. We have e3. Now we have knight f3. Bishop e2. d5. And now d4. So white has got a bit of a grip on the dark squares. And Fincetto's this bishop over here. Now this move, uh, maybe a6 was slightly better because after this move we have knight b5 nicking that dark square bishop. Yeah, is this is this going to be handy for you to get that dark square bishop? You might think this bishop's a bit of a prisoner behind its own pawn. Let's see. It is snapped off. Knight d2 f3 now d takes bishop drops back rook a e1 e4 this looks very nice and logical for white and white kind of blocks his own bishop you'd think with these two pawns how is this bishop gonna be dangerous ever on this diagonal It is a dangerous position. F4, it looks as though, you know, F5 is very serious, like a, playing against the French defence. The bishops stop all the entry points, actually. On, so Black's rooks, although they're double, they're not that uh, dangerous here at the moment. More dangerous is to parry F5, so G6. But now a nice little rook lift, rook E3. f5 this is actually taken 
It's a great move to take here. In fact, in fact, I'm not sure it was immediately even picked up the power of this from the engine point of view. Because this next move is so powerful now. F5. This nice pin on the queen. We have knight e4. That's actually just taken. And now f takes g6. Now here, if uh, hg, then that gives the opportunity to play rook g3. And that's dangerous for black. For example, queen g7, d5 hits the queen. And say rook c2, we can just take here actually, and then take the queen. We exchange up with d takes e6 after. So, okay, it looks as though in this position, it's not possible really to take this. If we look at this again, if we try queen h7 instead, then actually white has a chance to play rook f6. And if here it's getting a bit congested, rook h3 wins the queen. Checkmate to the queen. It's not possible, it seems, to do anything about g6 here. King h7. We have d5 opening on that, that diagonal. This is just too nasty. Yeah, it's, it's not good. Okay, so uh, we have rook c2 instead, leaving that dangerous pawn there. G takes h7 check. Okay, again, black doesn't want to be subjected to rook g3, so he doesn't take this. He actually tucks his king in the corner. Uh, if he plays queen takes, then I believe rook g3 check is too dangerous. That's, that's too dangerous. There's d5. Yeah, that diagonal's amazing, and black's getting mated. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, got to be careful around here. So we have king h8, but it is, it seems as though if only this bishop was really good on this diagonal. In fact, d5 check, it is good, but it's blunted, it seems, with e5. What an annoying move. And now we're forked, as might just messed up the whole thing. But we had a promising attack earlier with the bishop pair. Has he just messed everything up? <laughs> amazing. This is an 1883 game. It's amazing. Totally. This next move. Uh, I wonder if you can find it. I hope you haven't seen it. White to play. This is a double exclamation mark move. See, I'm having trouble calculating it myself, even though I know <laughs> the move. I'm having trouble calculating it. I mean, the moves presented. I know, I know the game. I've seen the game before, but I'm tr having trouble actually calculating the full uh, <laughs> consequence. Oh, many of you haven't seen this game. That's fascinating. Have you all left out Zakatort? from your knowledge of classic games. Oh, this is tragic at many levels. <laughs> Not to know Zakatorts. I think this is Zakatorts Immortal. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. You haven't seen this game, have you? No one's seen this game. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I'm going to have to read you who is Zakutort, right? I can't believe no one's seen this game. In 1868, he played and lost the match to Anson by... Uh, yeah, he played a f quite a few matches. He's considered one of the ablest attacking players of his generation. In fact, Knight F3 became known as Zuckertort's opening 40 years before it became known as the Retty opening. His name is also associated with the Cole Zuckertort opening. This move is staggering. This move is staggering. The thing is, I can't calculate it, even though I've, I know what the move is. I can't calculate it. And the engine gives it as plus 54. D6 is plus 2, so give yourself 5 points for D6. Let's quickly examine D6. I'm trying to distract. Uh, well, this is dangerous, right? Uh, because if, if say, takes... That's very, very dangerous. D takes, because then we got rook f8. Yeah, this has got big dangers to it, d6. Probably the best uh, reply, say queen g7, holding up e5. But now, actually, when it gets tricky here, queen takes gives white an advantage, technically. With the idea of rook g3, it's pretty obscure, actually. This is pretty obscure stuff very obscure to get any advantage from this d6 uh, so if takes here takes check and takes here this this is this is winning for white but um yeah takes here this this is uh Better, better for white. No, 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 no. You can't see it, can you? I can't even calculate. I know what the move is, but I can't calculate the consequences. Maybe, maybe I'm missing something. Here. So we're at a quandary. So you guys can't see the move, and I know the move, and I can't calculate it. It's funny. And this is just in 1883, this game. But the engine indicates it's like plus, you know, it's massively strong, this move. This is mysterious, isn't it? Well, how can someone be so resourceful? He had some imagination. It's a kind of drag and drop tactic for E5, but how on earth does it work queen b4 yeah let's see black baits rook 8 c5 why didn't you take the queen let me see what's going on with my calculations bishop takes e5 check not too many candidate moves for black because of that pawn so we have to play takes. Rook h3 check. It's a forced mate in 6. This is why I couldn't calculate it, I think. Because there's a very naughty trick here of seemingly playing the pointless check to go back to g3, where both rooks are now forcing that king onto the h file. If black wants to last as long as possible, the king goes to h6. But now, rook f6 check is a forced mate sequence. Again, a nifty checks with the rooks here to get this position where bishop f4 check and rook h7. So black's getting terminated, it seems, with these nifty checks, the subtle checks, because it's hard to calculate this stuff because you're going there to go there. It's like... I think you'll, it's a way of boiling the frog through a mysterious initial rook check. 
to get a position where you're actually boiling the frog, where the frog is taking away escape squares. The name of the game is the take king. It's very difficult to visualize this, even though I knew the move, I couldn't see quite the point. Yeah, so check with the point of rook g3 check, we're taking away a load of escape squares, by the way. And it so happens that rook f6 is then mating. If the king had gone to uh, h7, it's quicker. With rook f7 check, king's forced to h6, we have check and it's quicker. You see it's slightly quicker. So that is a remarkable bit of calculation. This is a feat of calculation, I've got to say. Because even though the move, I have it in front of me, I, I couldn't calculate it. I mean, can you blame me? Is it, is it that easy to calculate this checkmate? I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Is it? I don't know. Do, do you immediately, does anyone immediately see this is a forced checkmate, this position? I, I think it's the act of not just finding forcing moves, but you're, you're finding positions where there's a lack of escape squares, and then you do the execution job. If we, if we consider the process of checkmating the opponent's king, the process would be take away escape squares and then do a check. But here, okay, it starts with a check and then it's taking away escape squares with another check to, to get this position where we're taking away escape squares with this check. So they, they seem pointless to check, check there, but there's a real lack of escape squares. There's only these two. Then we play this check. Then we play that check. I mean, that's that's weird as well. If king uh, went here, then mate in free here, check. This is just an amazing feat of calculation in its own right. Just taking, yeah, on B. It's just amazing to see this. I don't know. Black ignored it, though. <laughs> Black played this, just ignored it. But now things get even crazier here. You know, it's it's clear that from this game, uh, Zuckertort must have uh, got a uh, stockfish uh, with a time machine, brought it back to his tournament venue in 1883, and secretly used it in the toilet. Because this next move is staggering as well now. Ah, <clears throat> oh, man. <laughs> What's the next move? White's play here. <laughs> this is incredible. Okay, another drag and drop tactic, trying to get the queen away from e5 with rook f8. And again, black ignores it. What if he takes it here? Bishop takes, this is a forced mate in eight, apparently. He takes here. Well, it assumes giving up the queen, though. If we just do the more sensible, it's a forced mate in five. This queen comes for the check here. This is a killer. And then the, the pieces all coordinate with check all the way. To checkmate the king. Yeah. <clears throat> There's no point really looking at that. You'd you'd think giving up the queen is not very good. And it's all it's all running with check actually for another checkmate here anyway. There's no time for black to use his material. You just you run it all with check. So there's no time to use the material. Okay, so uh yeah, that was that was ignored as well. King takes h7, but now queen takes e4 check. Finally, the king steps into that horrible diagonal. Bishop takes e5 check, another amazing move. Giving up the rook. Yeah, there's so many amazing moves in this game. <laughs> But actually, there's a really good move here as well. I can test you here. Sorry about that. I went a bit too quickly. White's play here. I, I should have I should have asked you about that other one. I mean, that was pretty nifty as well. Sorry, if we just, just rewind. Okay, imagine I didn't show you it. Would you really leave your rook hanging? Yeah, that's what he did. 
because he had something in mind here. He had something in mind here, which is really, really nifty in its own right as well. So white play here. Okay, this position white play here. These games are like caffeine. I, I, <laughs> to be honest, I was feeling a bit knackered before these games, but this one is definitely caffeinated. I'm feeling kind of awake all of a sudden. It's 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 the unbelievableness that someone is so resourceful back in this time. White's play here. He plays actually bishop g7. And one point is, this is ignored again. Black's really ignore it, doing a good job of ignoring this. If it takes, then we have queen e8 checkmate, where the king is immensely blocked in. So he ignores that, but he's just dropping his queen. Queen takes e7. And black actually resigns here. If he plays this check, king f2, the checks just run out. That's it. Yeah, so he did resign after Queen's taken. But what a fantastic move. It survives the engine test, this game. Queen b4 is the strongest move in the position. It's it's incredible. Let's imagine Queen e8 for a moment. I'm going to have to show you this. Rook f8. Getting the queen away from e5. Bishop takes e5. And we're in the similar territory of the disaster because this queen swings across. And the rook, bishop and queen, they're very nicely centralised here to coordinate uh, uh, the attack. Just working all with checks. So there's no respite for black. Yeah. So that, that doesn't help. Yeah. Queen, queen before. <clears throat> Here, um, we play rook f8, check. So if it takes, we take the queen. If it takes, bishop takes e5, it's very different here because we've got the queen as a liability. This position here, again, it's enough to make the black king there. Oh, this black has to give up the queen. It's hopeless. Yeah, there's no design. No, okay. Um, let's have a look at... Okay, he played the rook move. What about the other rook? Just for a moment. <laughs> th th this should be good enough. Just taking here. Yeah, e5. e5 is the big issue. Mm. Yeah, that's staggering. Queen g7 threatens mate. Let's give this a go. There's rook g3 here defending the mate and kicking the queen. If. Where can the queen go? Queen here? Again, there's rook f8 check. Yeah. And if here, uh, again, we're back to queen e4 check. Uh, yeah, queen b4. Whatever way you cut it, queen b4. <laughs> it just, just wins. It just wins. Queen, rook takes b2, we just take the queen, right? Yeah. Okay. The queen is attacked. Okay. I, 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 okay. Let's move on to another game. It's it's magical. It's magical. Uh, this game is kind of magical. All right. Yes. Yeah, Zakatol. So they there you have it. Zakatol. Wow. This this is just absolutely crushing technical play by Zakatol in this game. Okay. Uh, Steinitz against. Chagorin, um, yes. Actually, I, I've checked this out recently on the channel, but let's have a quick recap on this Steinitz Chagorin game. 
so Steinitz against Mikhail Shigorin. So E4, this was in the their World Champ Chess Championship of 1892. Uh, we have, uh, they were just as boring as we were today. Yes, the boringness wasn't invented apparently by Kramnik. It predates Kramnik. So this is uh, uh, <laughs> the Berlin defence. But unlike modern players, Steinitz actually plays it in a fun way. Yeah, against the Berlin defence. He actually plays d3. I think Magnus Colson should check this game out for what happens here. Everyone should check this game out. The Super GMs need to revisit this 1892 game. Uh, so c3, it's very logical play by White. Uh, we have a Fianchetto, very interesting. And instead of castling, which would use the f1 square, that goes in there to centralise rapidly uh, with knight e3 because white doesn't have to commit to castling. The rook clearly is very useful for a hack attack in this position. Uh, and we get that now, h4. Yes, black should probably pl treat this attack very seriously and play h5. I'm not sure h6 does it, because mm, h5, yes, we get light square play. Uh, like knight h2, we get light square play. Light squares all d pretty delicious there. So h5 would probably be the best and still maintains the balance. But black played knight e7. This is positional as well as attacking. It's improving the scope of the rook and it's also chipping away at black's king safety. Maybe black wanted to classically sort of punish him in an abstract way with a central counter attack to this flank attack. That sounds good in theory, but. In practice, let's see what happens. So hg, fg does weaken this diagonal. E takes and knight takes and the bishop goes back to this very now sensitive and sore diagonal. We have queen e2. <clears throat> bishop d7. Um, knight takes e5 is possible here that actually but actually it was ignored bishop e3 it was actually possible king h8 white castles queen side rook a e8 the queen uh is probably threatened between like knight f4 he gets ready with queen f1 away from that in advance but also the queen's got dangerous uh, intentions on f1 after a5 d4 we have e takes knight takes and after knight uh, sorry after bishop takes here the pawn's pinned so i'm not going to really ask you what happened here uh, too much except okay do you take with a bishop or do you take with a rook so how would you take here on d4 the bishop or the rook I give you 20 seconds there. <laughs> yeah, I have to say this is very clever actually stuff. Um Again, I mean, I've, I've, I've visited this game a few days back as well. The, the clever thing about this, um, for, first of all, we should note that taking with the bishop actually offers white very little after knight takes, rook takes. The position here is actually quite safe for black, believe it or not. Uh, there's only a light square bishop, there isn't a bishop pair. If we try, how can we put pressure on on the h4? It's it's gone. There's nothing. It's dry. It's dried up. It's boring. There's nothing. It's stable. But what isn't stable is this position after rook takes d4, and the reason it can't even get stable here after knight takes d4. There's no promise of it being stable after this next move which is so incredibly incisive it's unbelievable from Steinitz 
he doesn't entertain the possibility of any stability happening here. So what? How does he do that? White to play here. Although both, yeah, there's there's two moves which actually still totally win, but one is very very technically intricate compared to the other in many respects. I would say. actually interesting it echoes something about Steinitz which I haven't noticed before about this game right he doesn't take with the bishop because that might afford black you see, that's got a downside, you know. It's got a downside. The bishop's no longer got this diagonal at its disposal. And I'm just thinking, you know, Steinitz is very uh, wily and flexible and versatile. You know, he didn't routinely castle. You know, he played that knight maneuver instead because it offered something else instead of routinely castling. He got something out of that. And here he doesn't routinely do this because this might allow rook f6. And if we're not careful, we get a nothing position. 0, 0.00 but with intricate play in fact this position is winning but you'd need it needs some doing to find well maybe maybe not that much let me test you on this position there is, there is a move for white which wins here white, white to play here but it's more intricate than the other continuation but let's let's go for it anyway white to play here So the bishops are wonderful in theory, cutting across, taking away the escape squares of the king, pinned rook. How do you exploit this? It's, it's 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 technically intricate. I'm going to show you uh, Queen D3 threatens Queen G6. It's this pin as well as this pin, which is very useful. If Queen D6, if Queen takes G6 here, then there's Queen F4 check and Black wins because uh, of Queen because uh, of Bishop F5. But here, Queen G3, this is why I'm saying it's intricate, trying to do a drag and drop tactic like the other game. So if takes, we get this mate with the two bishops. It's intricate, this, it's a lesser known continuation. I'm showing you here. If here, this is really intricate stuff. There's a move here, which, this is just, this is computer territory tactics. Bishop E5, I'm not even sure why anymore I'm, I'm not sure why myself if Queen c6 what's the point oh, I think it's just to get time for Queen takes g6 and that's that's it that's all over so the move here you need time for Queen g6 but you can't allow Queen f4 check so you play Bishop e5 and that's winning it's very very intricate territory no he avoided all this even though that is technically winning much better continuation here is and give yourself 500 points is just rook takes h7 so the bishop is purposely left with the flexibility on this diagonal to support the queen because after check yeah the bishop and queen have that h6 so leaving that bishop on that diagonal he's avoiding that downside and it occurred to me it's a similar trait when he didn't castle the downside of castling was clearly that the f1 square earlier was and he didn't do that either so he plays very concretely Steinitz it seems yeah this is just so clinical because now check and mate 
He could have also done the checkmate with the queen h6. This is on the... Ch no. Later. Uh, check. Check. If here, then there's bishop h6 check. And then bishop takes f8 is checkmate. Yeah. If here, then we're back to queen takes d4. Yeah, there's something... Yeah, he's he's not, like, accepting routine moves and not ideas. And he gets all the advantages from doing that. Yeah? It's a very, very concrete game. It's just very, very accurately played, the whole thing. You'd, you'd think rook takes d4 has the idea of this, but it didn't. It has the idea... Actually, technically, all it's doing is the minimal thing it's doing is opening up this diagonal here. So keeping that bishop on this diagonal for this combination to be killing, because this bishop's now been opened up. It's brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. Did look at that a few days back on the channel if you want to check out a dedicated video, but most most of the significant uh, lines well, uh, have been covered here okay the, the last one I'd like to show you I mean these these are treasures really <clears throat> this is the ch a chess art gallery um, and I have looked at this recently I'm not sure if it's been uploaded yet it's on my schedule but I have analyzed this recently this is a Morphe game of 1892, uh, not 1892, 1849, back in 1849, New Orleans. So Morphy was about 12 years old, I think, in this game, 1849. Um, uh, I, I should really tell you how old Morphy was, actually. Morphy was born, um, just as a reminder, 1837. So yeah, about 12 years old. <clears throat> And with rook odds against Charles the Carpentier, I don't know if Charles the Carpentier was a carpenter. Maybe he was. I don't know. The carp the carpenter. Okay. Anyway, so e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4 takes bishop c4. We have check. C3 takes castles c takes and black kind of plays the strange retreat well he's been put on the defensive here with his king stuck in the center e5 d6 and the remarkable discovery i i had this is when i was checking this game out um is that after rookie one <laughs> How do I put this? <clears throat> this next move is 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 bad. D takes e5. It's even bad a rook up, apparently. It's so bad, this move, D takes e5, that even though black uh, was a rook up, this position is technically winning uh, for white with best play. It's actually technically winning for white with best play this position. That's how bad d takes e5 is. But for me, uh, this this was actually I, I have I kid you not. This is actually a shock for me uh, that the evaluation can change so dramatically. Yes, the king's in the center. And we have the active bishops and active rook. But it's st still a bit of a shock once you realize exactly why uh, black's kind of potentially losing by force here. Um, and it, it wasn't actually demonstrated um, by Morphy. Uh, Morphy played... He was only 12, so let's let him off the hook. He played knight takes e5. And black would, is still winning technically after knight takes e5. And before going into the game... Okay, so Morphy, he wasn't total tactical genius at this point. There, there were some flaws uh, if this is the game score. But there's there's a move here. Sorry, this, this really attracted me why this 
a rook down is all of a sudden winning for white here. Okay, so white's playing and win by force, a rook down. So what's what's the first move here? Okay, someone may have mentioned it on the chat. Okay, okay. Bishop takes f7, all right? It, it seems, hang on, this is snagged, right? Because we can't take the queen because of knight takes. But the point here is knight takes, trying to lure the, the knight away from the queen. And this this variation is, is winning for white. Uh, if king e8, well, we're in, we're in the firing line of the rook. So all sorts of things win. Knight takes c6 wins. Yeah, we don't have to look at that but the clever bit here which I don't know I found it a little bit shocking is that say we take in this position this position remember white's a rook down okay but let's say we look at king e7 and here is where I think people take engines for granted because this this move here is is technically winning for white there's a move here which is technically winning for white which i i found a, a little bit on the shocking side when i was analyzing this a few days ago so white white play here remember because white was a rook down right so he, so say black yeah he avoids losing his queen to that tactic but what does white play here which is so powerful okay it's powerful it's so powerful it's mega powerful it's a rook down but it's winning for white this position I mean this I'm talking about winning against best play it's winning against best play a rook down Queen b3 it threatens all sorts Bishop takes Knight takes if knight f6, you'll see that the bishop's protected here. So we just have knight takes, knowing that the king is really trapped in the center. It's just all winning for white. It's end of game. Bishop a3 is quite good as well. That would force queen d6. But this is just totally winning. I just found this queen b3 in particular remarkable in this side variation. That, you know, because remember, white was a rook down and now he's technically winning. So that's an aside from the game. But Morphy, to his credit, got this fantastic position by playing this way. But he actually played knight takes e5. And this, this isn't winning with best play. Um, Black did the right thing to take on d1. And the point was bishop takes f7. But Black still can win this game with best play if he plays king d8 then there's nothing for white nothing end of game does everyone know that there's nothing here yeah you know if we take here our rook's pinned we can't go over there we, this is nothing but thankfully, <laughs> mm, sorry, yeah, okay, black <laughs> played king e7. That's good for Morphe. He, Black's, Morphe's about play, the carpenter played king e7. And black's slightly better with best play if, if he plays best play. White now, guess what white plays? Okay, white white play here. Can you see what white plays here? <laughs> I 
<laughs> it's the final position that's a cracker. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Final position is amusing. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. This is a double check, right? So the, qu the qu no time to take there. Now black should play now the king to the d file, either here, or here, or here. <laughs> Any of those three is quite good, and black actually retains a, an advantage with any of those three. Black has the advantage. Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, as an example, King D six takes the king could actually go venturing off to c5 <laughs> yeah you, you get the idea here affords the luxury of bishop d6 and again it's not totally fatal for black even though black loses the rook it's not totally uh it's slightly it's okay for black and you know last point king d8 uh you know we have bishop d6 again and similar to what I just mentioned but no black <laughs> black was a bit greedy this is what happens in chess when you're too greedy black greedily took the bishop <laughs> now can you see the punchline the punchline white's play <laughs> this is coincidental. I don't know. All the escape squares. Yeah. Uh, you can all see it, can you? The final move. check and actually these are ruled out all these squares are ruled out even f6 is ruled out it's checkmate it's uh, he got a bit lucky didn't he Morphe it was lucky it was lucky it, it wasn't brilliant he was just lucky sorry no no I don't want to I don't want to spoil it no it's it's funny we spoil it when he, he got lucky but actually he had a forced win the funny thing about this game is that white a rook down has a forced win does does everyone know that about this game am I the only person in the world that doesn't know that about this game that white had a forced win yeah a rook down did, am I am I the only one? This is actually a forced win. I can't believe I couldn't believe this is a forced win. This position earlier. That's my um shocking thing about this game as well, right? That actually, you know, this bishop takes f7 as a forced win. Does everyone know that? I mean, I don't know if this is general knowledge or not. But anyway, it's it's a beautiful final position. It's got to be said as well. There's there's funny things about this game. It's it's just it's just funny. The whole thing about this game is funny. That a rook down, okay, it's a rook odds game, but for that also to be a forced win earlier. So he got a bit lucky. Um and it's it's Charles the Carpenter's only game actually in the chess gamescom database. I don't believe he played uh, any other games at chess gamescom. Um born eighteen twenty by the way, died eighteen eighty six, sixty six years old. He, oh, he was Paul Morphy's uncle. Oh, I should have said. It says here he was Paul Morphy's uncle. His occupation is described as a broker or a commission merchant, but it's his only game. Okay, he was Paul Morphy's uncle. I don't know. These games, it's like... There's some trivia in there, which is super interesting, because they're so well known. You'd think, you know, it's nice to know a bit of trivia about them as well. Yeah, which might not have been uh, mentioned before. 
Okay, okay, I hope you enjoyed these games. Um, okay, so thanks. Uh, comments and questions on YouTube, and uh, see you next week. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you want to like, likes, 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 really appreciated. Likes, appreciate, yeah. If you want to like the video, that'd be really cool. So, yeah, I'll give you a moment to like the video. Hold on a sec, yeah. Yeah, bring up the lights. Come on, come on. I, 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 I <laughs> yeah, this, this, I don't know. These games are just amazing. They woke me up. I was actually very tired before the start. I didn't know how I'd, I'd do, but uh, the games that are like caffeine. These games, you know, they wake you up. Okay. So, yeah, likes appreciated. And um, see you uh, next week. I'll give you 20 seconds to like. <laughs> okay. Uh, unbelievable game. I think... Yeah, they're all very good at covering the escape squares of the king. That's old school chess. You cover the escape squares, you checkmate. That's old school chess in these games. Rook lifts. Drag and drop tactics. Okay. Thanks very much.